Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be part of this uh, very distinguished conference. I, um, this is one of my, I think this is my fourth visit to Dubai. I, I always remember my first visit. I came from the airport in a taxi. Try, he was taking me to my hotel and we couldn't find my hotel and we went around and around. This is maybe 2006. We went around and around and around the block and finally we found it and the taxi driver said to me, you know, I'm certain that hotel was not there a month ago, which I thought was the most Dubai statement ever. Um, anyway, it's good to be back. Um, what I thought I would uh, talk a, a little bit about was um, how the uh, challenges facing governments are changing in the modern world. You know, if you think about the way that we construct uh, government institutions throughout the world, they're based on, those institutions were all uh, based on models that came from the 19th century, in some cases even the 18th century. And the expectations we have about government were also set in the 18th and 19th century. We expected our government to provide security for us, to develop and enforce the rule of law, and to ensure us against various kinds of problems, disasters, unforeseen events. That is a set of expectations that have remained in place now for nearly 200 years. But what I would like to argue this morning is that there has been very recently a dramatic shift in the nature of what people want and need from their government. And this shift, in fact, doesn't just affect the way the governments are structured, it also affects the way that many different professions are, are structured throughout the world. And that one of the great challenges that faces governments and professions, anyone who has to deal with the public, is coming to terms with the nature of this dramatic shift. Um, and I thought the best way to explain this is to use a paradigm, uh, a really interesting theory that comes from a man named Gre Gregory Treverton, who is a very senior intelligence official in the United States, uh, a, a real intellectual when it comes to national security, who wrote a very famous essay about 10 years ago where he made a distinction between what he called puzzles and mysteries. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, if you think back to the most serious foreign policy crisis of the Cold War era, it may well have been uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you remember in your history, the Cuban Missile Crisis takes place in the summer of 1962, when the Ameri American government notices that a number of ships from the Soviet Union, 20, 38 ships in all, have sailed from Russia to Cuba and unloaded some mysterious cargo. And they begin to get very alarmed about what that mysterious cargo is. So the CIA sends a series of uh, spy planes, this is before the age of drones and satellites, a series of spy planes to fly over Cuba. They take a thousand pictures. They bring those pictures back to Washington, D.C. They develop them and they see, lo and behold, the cargo, the mysterious cargo on these Soviet ships are medium range, nuclear tipped ballistic missiles aimed directly at the United States. That is what set in motion the Cuban Missile Crisis. The United States demanded that the Soviet Union remove those missiles, and in the ensuing showdown, the world came as close as it's ever come to blowing itself up. Now, think about that problem from the CIA's perspective. They, had a, they knew that they had a, a, an enemy who harbored some kind of uh, untoward evil intentions towards them, how did they resolve that question? They went out, they gathered information, and that information pointed directly to a course of action, right? Now, compare that to the signature foreign policy crisis of our era in, when it comes to the United States. If you were, the American public would say that the most serious foreign policy crisis of the last generation was 9-11. 9-11 begins the same way. The US intelligence establishment is concerned that their enemy, Al-Qaeda, harbors some kind of evil intention towards them. But the way that crisis unfolds is very different. 
In the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the response was to go out and gather more information. Right? In the case of 9-11, the problem, the, the task of the facing the CIA was to make sense of the information they already had. Right? They already knew that something was up for the fall of of 2001. They knew that it involved aircraft. They'd already captured some Al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States. They, they knew that it was supposed to be something big and dramatic. I mean, they, I could go on and on. They found someone who was taking pictures in the Boston airport in the summer of 2001. They arrested someone <coughs> at a flight training school in Arizona in the summer of 2001. In the case of 9-11, the problem facing the United States was not in gathering information to point to a conclusion, but in making sense of the information they already had. Now, we lump those two foreign policy crises together, and we, we treat them both as examples of the same kind of problem, but they could not be more different. And what Gregory Treverton would say is that the Cuban Missile Crisis was a puzzle. And a puzzle is a problem caused by a lack of information. Right? To the contrary, 9-11 is what he would call a mystery. And a mystery is a problem caused by too much information. The challenge when it comes to a mystery is how to sort through the mound of data in front of you and figure out what it means. Now this is, Craverton argues, an extremely important distinction for a number of reasons. The first reason is that you have to know the kind of problem that you're facing if you want to solve it. If you're facing a puzzle, the path to a solution is very different than if you're facing a mystery. You go about solving those problems in fundamentally different ways. But more than that, he says, the reason this distinction is so critical is that most of the institutions that we have built in the modern world uh, coming out of the 19th century to, s to solve our problems are built on the assumption that the problems we face are puzzles. That the task of institutions is to gather information in order to solve problems. But Treverton says the problem with that is that that's not true anymore. That the nature of the problems that we face are now overwhelmingly mysteries. They are problems not of a lack of information, but of too much information. Right? In other words, we have institutions that are not suited to the type of challenges that we face. Now, I said earlier that I think this is a transition that is affecting all aspects of modern life. And you can pick almost any profession, and you can see how they are grappling, struggling to deal with this transition from a puzzle to a mystery. Let me give you an example from medicine. I think, in fact, that the world of medicine is one of the areas that has had to deal with this transition most uh, acutely. A generation ago, if you were a middle-aged man complaining of pain in your hips and spine and blood in your urine, you would go to your urologist. The urologist would give you a rectal exam. If he found a lump on your prostate, he would say, you have prostate cancer. We're taking it out. That is medicine as puzzle solving. You present with a problem. You gather information. There's a clear course of action. Right? Now that's not the way we work. That's not the way that particular problem unfolds. Now if you are a middle-aged man, we encourage you to go to your doctor and get what's called a PSA test which is a blood test that measures the presence of an antigen in your blood associated with an enlarged prostate. If your PSA test is elevated, the doctor says we should look more closely. They'll do uh, an ultrasound. If the ultrasound is problematic, they'll do a biopsy. They will take a little sliver of your prostate. If they see some kind of unusual cell growth, they will recommend a course of action, whether it's radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, or doing nothing. Now, that is a profoundly different way of solving the problem. And it requires a very different set of skills on the part of the doctor who's involved. In fact, there is almost nothing in common between those two ways 
of treating the disease. Let me explain. The PSN, I, forgive me, I'm going to go on a little 10-minute detour here about prostate cancer, um, which is, I know, a bit much for first thing in the morning. But bear with me, because I think it's important to understand this transition if we are to, to understand the much more important question of how the responsibilities of governments are shifting in the modern era. So the PSA test that we give to middle-aged men is on a scale of zero to as high as you want to go. Zero is normal, and uh, the higher your score is, the more abnormal we think your prostate might be. We have decided that the cutoff point for when we think there's a problem is a score of four. Now, why did we choose four as the, as the cutoff for when we think there's a problem? There's no real reason. It's just a matter of judgment. In our judgment, in the judgment of many doctors, four is when things start to get problematic. Is it the case that if you lowered that number, you would find more cancer? Yes. There is probably as much cancer at a cutoff point of three as there is at four. It's a matter of judgment, right? All right, when we say cancer, what do we mean? Well, normally when you have a tumor, you just, and you're going to biopsy that tumor, what you do is you just take a, some cells from the tumor and you see whether they are cancerous, right? But with an enlarged prostate, there is no tumor. It's just that the prostate is in some early stages of transition. So what we do is we, and forgive me, I really am getting into the details here, but if you're a man, your prostate is the size of a golf ball, this big. What we do is we divide it up into six areas. We take a slice from each area. Why do we take six slices? No particular reason. It's just we figure six is a good number. If we take 12 slices, would we find more cancer? Yes, we would. So why don't we lower the cutoff point to, say, two and do 12 slices instead of six? We'd find more cancer, wouldn't we? Right? Well, now it gets tricky again. What do we mean by cancer? There's three kinds of cancer. Category one is cancer that moves so slowly that if you ignored it, you would die of something else first. Category two is cancer that moves so fast that nothing you can do is going to save your life. Category three is cancer that moves at a medium pace, and if you get there in time and stop it, you'll live. All right? Now, screening for prostate cancer makes no difference in category one you weren't going to die of prostate cancer. It makes no difference in category two. You're dead anyway. And in fact, in, in both those cases, it can be worse than doing nothing at all to intervene. The only area, a kind of cancer, where it makes sense to do something is category three, the kind of cancer that moves at a medium pace, and if you catch it in time, you can save your life. OK, so here's the crucial question facing the physician. What is the ratio of? type 1 and type 2 cancer to type 3? The answer is almost all prostate cancer is 1 and 2. Almost all cancer is a kind of cancer for which intervening in the, almost all prostate cancer is a kind of cancer in, in which intervening makes no sense. Right? Now do you understand how hard the task of the doctor is? In the old model, the doctor had, the physician had an operational role. His, uh, I'm sorry, in the old model, the, the, the physician ha was a collector of information. He simply gathered some data and acted, right? It was really simple. Now the doctor has to be an analyst of information. He has all of this really confusing information about his patient, and he has to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to use four as the cutoff point or something else? Am I going to take six slices or 12? How do I decide whether my patient is one, two, or three? How do I make sense of all the various risks and benefits of all the different methods of treatment I have? Drugs, uh, radiation treatment, surgery, doing nothing. It has all of a sudden gone from a very straightforward procedure to a complicated, intellectually complicated procedure. More than that, in the old paradigm, the doctor was played an operational role. His job was to find out whether your prostate needed to be removed and remove it. 
Today, the doctor plays a social role. Today, the doctor has this primary responsibility is to communicate in a meaningful manner with his patient, right? To understand how his patient feels about what the most appropriate course of action is. So if you're a man, your risk of having prostate cancer is your age. I am 54 years old. I have a 54% chance of having prostate cancer. I happen to be someone who is so convinced that most prostate cancer is category one and two that I don't care. I don't want, and I'm never gonna have my prostate checked, ever. I'm completely unmoved by all this. There's a statistic that says that we treat 100 men for prostate cancer in order to save one life. I look at that and say it's not worth it. Now, there could be another man in this audience who hears those same statistics and says, I absolutely want to get my prostate checked tomorrow, right? That's, I'm not right and they're not wrong and they're not wrong and I'm not right. The, it's just different perspectives on how to deal and live with risk. If you're a doctor, you need to understand what your patient feels, how they, what their attitude towards risk is, how they want to live their life, do they want to ignore risks or they, do they want to confront them head on? And somehow have those kinds of complicated conversations with a patient and come up with a solution that is most appropriate for them. That is what medicine as mystery solving looks like. And it has nothing in common with the way that medicine has been practiced for hundreds of years up to this point. In fact, I would venture to say that there are very few doctors today who were educated during their time in medical school into how to handle the much more difficult and complicated social questions of modern medicine. Rather, they were educated and trained in the old model of medicine as puzzle solving. Now, I think that exact same shift is what is facing governments that we have built a series of government institutions around the world that are premised on the notion that the problems that we face are puzzles, that governments play an opera operational role and the government's job is to collect information and dispense resources accordingly. But that is not the nature of the world we live in anymore. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, for example, think about education. It's pretty well accepted that one of the most important responsibilities of governments in the modern world is to provide a quality public education for their citizens. There is probably no more important responsibility when it comes to preparing a modern economy to succeed, right, than having a well-educated population. So how do you ensure that your education system is of the highest possible quality. Well, after a full several generations of research, we've come to a much better understanding of this. We used to think that it was simply a matter of spending enough money on education or making classes small enough or building schools. Now we understand more and more that the most critical person and in the whole education equation is the teacher. Good teachers make an enormous difference in how good an educational system is. To give you an example of this, a teacher in the 80th percentile will teach your child a year and a half's material in one year. A teacher <clears throat> in the 20th percentile will teach your child half a year's material in one year. That is a difference of uh, a full year of learning in one year between a very good teacher and a mediocre teacher. That is enormous. That is astronomically large. Right? And what that says is the primary responsibility of a government in the modern age is to figure out a way to maximize the quality of teachers in the classroom. Right? Now, how do we do that? Well. Uh, in the past generation or so, there has been a whole move throughout the world to what's called value-added metrics. Value-added metrics simply say, what we do with a teacher is, at the beginning of every school year, 
we measure the performance of the children in that classroom. Say we give them all a reading test and we see where they fall. Are they in the 60th percentile as a group? And then at the end of the year, we measure them again. And we, if they now fall in the 50th percentile as a group, we see that that teacher has had a minus 10 effect on the class, has moved them back 10 percentile points. If they now fall in the 70th percentile, we say that teacher is a plus 10 and is someone, is the kind of teacher who can move our students ahead. That, I grossly simplified how that works, but that describes how we are around the world measuring the quality of teachers increasingly. And if you look in various countries that have adopted value-added metrics, you can say they have become increasingly important. We're using them to drive uh, hiring decisions, firing decisions, to decide how much to pay people, whether to promote people. Parents are using those measures to decide what schools they want to go to or what teachers they want for their children. They have become extremely important. They have defined the, what people think of as the responsibility of government in the educational world. Now, what have we learned very recently, though, about value-added metrics? Well, we've learned that the problem is a good deal more complicated. So, for example, what we've discovered is that value-added metrics are incredibly variable. So there are, for example, there are all kinds of different ways, different algorithms that can be used to measure a teacher's value-added score. They all have subtle, they're based on the same idea, but they have subtle differences. What happens if I use a different algorithm to try and measure a teacher's quality? What happens is you see that a teacher will go from being ranked as one of the best to ranked as mediocre. Incredible movement. What happens <clears throat> if I measure uh, a teacher in different subjects? So I want to know how good a math teach, mathematics teacher is at teaching mathematics. So I measure them in their calculus class, and I get a score for them. What happens if I measure them in their algebra class? Will those two scores correspond? The answer is they won't. A teacher can be seen as a brilliant teacher of algebra, but a terrible teacher of calculus. Most important, what happens if I, if I measure a teacher's quality over different years? What if I compare my score as a teacher this year with my score as a teacher last year? What I discover is there are huge swings from year to year. A teacher who can be seen as superb in one year can have a terrible score the next year. Now, any kind of measure that's trying to assess the quality of performance that's that variable is, is, is a problem. It's highly problematic, right? How do you have any faith in that? So what's the reason for that high variability? The reason is that good teaching, we now understand, is about an interaction between a teacher and a student. Right? You can't take the student out of the equation. That students are responding to a certain kind of teacher teaching a certain kind of subject in a certain kind of situation. The reason that teachers can have scores that are really high one year and really low the next is that their students have changed. And one teacher can be fantastic at teaching a room full of very, very capable students from well-educated backgrounds and be very poor at teaching a classroom of students who are not that capable from poor backgrounds and vice versa. Some teachers can be fantastic at teaching poor students and not very good at teaching highly capable students. Now think about what that fact means for the role of government. It used to be the case that if you were trying to build a quality educational system, you were solving a puzzle. You were just deciding, where do I spend resources? And you would collect information about teachers and you would say, oh, I need to hire that person and fire that person. Now that we understand, though, that good teaching is about an interaction between a teacher and a particular pupil, the task of managing and creating an effective school has gotten an order of magnitude harder. All of a sudden, now we are faced with a much more complicated task. We have to simultaneously measure the quality of teachers and the quality of students. We have to figure out how they intersect, and then we have to arrange schools 
such that the, there is the best possible fit between the person in the front of the classroom and the person in the classroom. That is not easy. That requires negotiations with teachers, with parents, constant monitoring of students. More than that, it requires that we shift from thinking about students as groups to thinking about students as individuals. It requires that the educational system no longer think about serving a classroom of students, but it requires the educational system to start saying, how does this student differ from that student, different from that student, and relate to this teacher or that teacher or that teacher? When you understand the problem of education as a mystery, you understand that the role of the government has profoundly changed. They are now in the business of providing individualized, personalized solutions and not group solutions. Let me give you another uh, example of uh, this particular shift. Um, there was a really interesting paper that came out a couple weeks ago uh, by a group of public health uh, experts at the Bloomberg School in University of, at, at Johns Hopkins University in, in, uh, in the United States. And they were looking at life expectancy. And they made the observation, they were comparing life expectancy gains in every decade since the 1950s all around the world. And they observed that in the 1950s and 1960s, there were huge increases in life expectancy in virtually every country in the world. But since then, over the last 20 years or so, those gains have slowed dramatically, and even in some cases, have gone into reverse. Now the question is, why is this happening? Well, uh, you might say, well, it makes sense, because now that we've raised average life expectancy so high, we're now coming up against the natural biological limits of the human lifespan, you would expect the gains to slow. And that's true in part, but then the researchers point out that the biggest slowdown in life expectancy increases are in the countries that have the lowest life expectancy, right? The group of countries that have life expectancy of below 51 years are the ones who've seen the biggest slowdown. That has nothing to do with natural biological limits to how, how high you, how long you can live, right? That's a whole different problem. Okay, you might say, well, maybe this is simply a, st a statistical uh, consequence of this very unusual thing that happened in the world in the 1980s and 1990s, which was the AIDS epidemic, right? And they say, the researchers say, yes, that's true, but it uh, turns out that even in countries that had, that largely escaped the brunt of the AIDS epidemic, we see the same pattern, right? So it's not the AIDS epidemic. Then you might say, well, maybe it's because in the last 20 or 30 years, we have been spending less and less on healthcare. Totally not true. We've been spending more and more. What about, maybe it's the case that in the last 20 years, we have had a real slowdown in medical innovation. Not true. The opposite is true. The last 20 years have been a golden age of medical innovation. Right? So what's the reason for this puzzling change? Why have one of the, it's one of the most disturbing facts about the modern world that all of a sudden the tremendous gains that we made in the post-war era are slowly coming to a halt and in many cases being reversed. The answer is that the nature of the problem that we face when it comes to providing quality health care uh, to our citizens has changed, right? In the 1950s, if you were trying to solve the problem of making your population healthier, it was a puzzle. What you needed to do was to provide more resources, buy more drugs, build more hospitals, uh, hire more doctors. It was fairly straightforward. But now we're dealing with a problem that is a mystery. It's a good deal more complicated. And it's not caused by, in many cases, by a lack of resources. In many cases, it's caused by an excess of resources, right? Think about a problem, possibly one of the most serious medical healthcare problems facing the world today, which is diabetes. The problem that is exploding in every corner of the world. I think the number of 
diabetes deaths is expected to double around the world between now and 2030. And the cost of diabetes to healthcare systems, as I'm sure all of you know, is astronomical. This is the thing that's going to bankrupt us. What is diabetes caused by? It is caused by changes in lifestyle. It's brought about by affluence. It's about sedent increasingly sedentary habits and increasingly rich diets that are causing people to have their people's physiology to spiral out of control in ways we could never have imagined. And how do you solve the problem of diabetes being out of control? Well, you can make some inroads by spending more, by buying more drugs and hiring more physicians and building more hospitals. But fundamentally, the problem that you face is that you have to convince your population to change their lifestyle, to eat better and to exercise more. And that's not easy. That requires that you learn how to motivate people. That requires that you understand their psychology, that you speak to them from a position of credibility and trust, that you reach into their, into their individual uh, hearts and motivate them in ways that governments aren't used to doing. Tackling modern healthcare problems requires that governments behave in ways that they have never behaved before and learn to speak to people in a way they've never had to speak to them before. One last example. The, uh, many of you remember last summer there was that cyber attack in Europe, the WannaCry cyber attack, which has the effect of shutting down the British uh, healthcare service uh, crippling FedEx's operations in, Federal Express's operations in Europe. It ended up affecting, I think, 300,000 uh, computer systems in 150 countries. And in many cases, people were required to pay ransoms to get their systems up again, working again. You know, this is an example of something that is in becoming increasingly common, right? This ransomware or whatever cyber attacks, whatever phrase we use to describe it, and what is interesting about it is that it represents a fundamentally novel kind of risk. We're used to the idea that somebody would go into a bank and rob that bank. We're, in, we're used to the idea of theft that takes place on an individualized, case-by-case -case basis. This is structural theft. This is theft that affects an entire system across national boundaries. We've never really faced that kind of crime before. Right? It's a completely unfamiliar kind of risk. Or think about what's going to take place in the coming decade when we move to autonomous vehicles. Virtually everyone considers the move to autonomous vehicles as inevitable. Right? We're, that's where we're all headed. And what autonomous vehicles will do is they will greatly reduce the amount of accidents that are due to human error, right? That's the great advantage. But they bring with them a new, completely novel kind of risk, and that is the risk that comes from some kind of third-party interference. Your car now becomes an object that can be hacked by an outsider, right? And if you want to be terrified, have a conversation with someone in the autonomous vehicle business about how they intend to defend against hacking threats to automobiles. And their answer is, eh, we don't really know, right? We have an entirely new kind of risk on the horizon that we've not coped with before. Now, I could go down the list and talk about the number of novel risks that are lurking on the horizon in our world. Think about climate change. For millennia, we have dealt with the fact that the weather is highly variable, that we have droughts and floods, that we have hurricanes, that we have all kinds of ups and downs in the weather. And we've developed institutions to deal with them, private insurance, public insurance. We have found a way to make the unpredictable predictable, and it's worked really well. But now we have climate change coming along, and climate change is a kind of unpredictability that we have never seen before, that we cannot properly model or account for, and which our institutions, our insurance institutions, don't know how to deal with. This is an entirely novel kind of risk, right? Now, 
Will we develop ways of dealing with these novel risks? I'm sure we will. But I think we all have to understand what uh, kind of threat these sorts of novel risks face, right? Novel risks are profoundly upsetting and anxiety producing for the public. You know, last year around the world, 1.25 million people died in automobile accidents. That is a terribly high number, and that is 1.25 million uh, individual tragedies. But none of those automobile accidents caused fundamental breakdown in societies, right? Why? Because we've been dealing with the risks of automobiles for over 100 years. We understand why they happen, and we understand uh, what we can do to prevent them. But all of a sudden, if you have a situation where someone hacks into uh, a tractor trailer driving at 70 miles an hour down a highway and causes a 100-car pileup and 200 people die, that's a kind of risk we haven't seen before. And that's going to be profoundly terrifying. Similarly, if we wake up one day and Miami and Mumbai and countless other coastal cities are underwater, right? That is going to be, and millions of people are displaced and billions of dollars in real estate is lost. That is going to be profoundly upsetting to people in a way that we've never seen before. And what will that require of government? That will require that government play a very different role than it's had to play in the past. Government's going to have to, to learn how to reassure people in a time of unusual anxiety, but how to reach out and to uh, calm their fears and to convince them that our institutions are good enough to get us through this period and to treat them and to think about them from a psychological perspective and not just as a recipient of resources or some kind of, of institutional mechanism. That is going to be really hard. Right? You know, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that as we move into an increasingly technologically sophisticated world, that all of this new data and algorithms and tools that are at our disposal are going to make the job of managing governments easier. And I think that is a mistake that as we raise the sophistication of the tools and the data and the algorithms that surround us, we're going to have to simultaneously raise the sophistication of our social gifts in government. Governments are going to have to learn how to treat people as, inst as individuals. They're going to have to learn how to reassure people who are frightened. And they're going to have to learn how to motivate people to change their lives in meaningful ways. That is the challenge that I think all governments around the world are going to face over the next generation. They're going to have to find a way to be more human. Thank you so much.